You may be seated. And as you're taking your seats, I invite you to grab a Bible and open a Bible to Luke chapter 10 this morning as we begin a short sermon series looking at the parables of Jesus over the coming weeks. We begin with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear and receive God's word, we go to him in prayer this morning. Our first prayer is for the Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and minds to be receptive to the teachings and the words of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that they would be comforted and encouraged by the gospel of Jesus and to know him and his love for them. Father, I ask that you would pray for me that I would speak and preach clearly the word of God and the good news of Jesus Christ as Savior for sinners. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So as we go into the parable of the Good Samaritan, this is probably Jesus' most famous teaching along with the story of the prodigal son. Even people that don't really go to church, don't know the Bible too well, don't read their Bible, everybody knows the story of the Good Samaritan or knows at least the phrase, the Good Samaritan. So as we dive in this morning, there's three things that I want to look at with you as we go into God's Word. And the first is... What is the expert of the law, the lawyer, asking Jesus? What is he really asking him? Why is he asking his question? And what is the ultimate purpose of the parable? So what is he asking? Why is he asking this question? And what is the purpose of this parable? So in verse 25, and I'm using uh, my favorite translation. It's a little different than the Pew Bible, but it's still in English, so you'll follow along. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Now an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you understand it? And the expert answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. And so... The beginning part of this story is the expert is actually pretty good. He knows the answer to the question. And in fact, when Jesus is asked the exact same question uh, later on in the Gospels and other places in Scripture, what is the greatest commandment? What must we do to inherit eternal life? Jesus gives the exact same answer. So, of course, Jesus looks at the guy and goes, great job. You've got the answer. And then he tells him, go and do it and you'll live, right? And when I was in college and undergrad and studying uh, in pre-seminary classes, one of our professors preached on this passage, and it was one of the greatest sermons ever because it lasted for about one minute. (laughs) He got up, he read that section that I just read to you, and he goes, it's really that simple. You guys just go out and do those two commands and you will live. And he walked back to the pew and sat down. And every good Lutheran in the chapel panicked. (laughs) We're like, where's the grace? Where's the gospel? Because how many of you are like the Lord? You know the answer. It's a very simple answer, right? What are the two greatest commandments? What What is the whole Bible about? Love the Lord your God with everything you are and love your neighbor, love your fellow man, right? It's that simple. But the problem is, we know the answer, we're like the Lord, I can answer the question on the test, but I don't answer it in how I actually live. But here's how the lawyer, the expert in the religious laws is different than you and me. Verse 29, this is where his testing comes from, okay? Verse 29, but the expert, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Right? He doesn't ask who God is. He's like, I will love the Lord. Right? How many of you find it easier to love Jesus than someone close to you? Right? Show of hands. How many of you are like, Jesus is a lot easier than the people in my life to love? Right? Don't, don't, you're not going to make them feel bad because they feel the same way about you. All right? <laughs> We're all in this together. Jesus, totally great. I'm on board with the first commandment. 
And I know when we read this story, right, we're like, oh man, the expert in law, he's so bad, he's so selfish. But he's asking the, from a human perspective, what? Kind of a legitimate question. Who's my neighbor? Because love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, well, who's my neighbor? Because, I mean, surely you don't mean everybody. Surely you don't mean certain types of people or kinds of people or people have done this or that or say this or believe this or think this way, right? Basically, what the expert in law is asking is, can we narrow down the definition of neighbor? Can we lower the number of people that God wants me to love? Now, where does he get this question? Because wrapped up in this one question is really two things that he's asking Jesus. He's really asking Jesus these two questions. Do I really have to love the sinner? And do I really have to love someone who can never pay me back for it? And where he gets this idea from is a book called Sirach. It was written by a man named Joshua Ben Sirach about 180 years before uh, Jesus was born. It's in the Apocrypha, so it's not biblical, but it was part of their wisdom literature. And so as an expert in the law, in the traditions of the Jewish people, he would have known this book. And you have to understand that in Jesus' day, people respected the rabbis incredibly highly. And so they had schools of theology, schools of thought. Think about it as our day and age, we have denominations, right? So we have the Bible, but we have denominations. We think it should be read this way, we think it should be read this way, et cetera, right? And it was the same thing for the day of Jesus. So what the man is asking is, hey, look, there's this school of thought. Many rabbis teach this. It's in the book of Sirach. Do you agree with it? And here's what the book of Sirach chapter 12 says in relation to this man's question. It says, if you do good, know to whom you do it, and you will be thanked for your good deeds, right? So he's like saying, there, there's motivation of, I'm doing this good deed, so you will what? You'll thank me, you'll praise me, you'll recognize me. And then it goes on, do good to the devout or the righteous, the good person, the religious person, and you will be repaid, if not by them, certainly by the most high. So again, what's his motivation for doing good? Well, I'm gonna do it to the the other good religious person, I'm gonna do it to the Pharisees, Jesus talks about the Pharisees. Therefore, they will what? They'll be able to pay me back, right? I know I've joked about this before, but when you go out to lunch or dinner with another group of people, there's the back and forth of, oh, I'll do it, and then I'll pay for it this time, and then I'll pay for it next time, right? We wanna be paying back and forth, make everything even. And so this is in this man's head. Come, who's my neighbor? In his mind, his neighbor is the good person, the religious person, the devout person, and the person who's able to return the favor to me. But it gets um, even more into this. He says in verse four, Sirach chapter 12, give to the devout, so give to the righteous person, the good person, the religious person, the holy person, right? Give to the devout, but do not help the sinner. So this shows you why is this man asking this question of Jesus? Why is he trying to trick him? He's saying, look, this is the popular way of thinking is, oh yeah, we're called to love our neighbor, but we define neighbor as the good, righteous, devout person who can return the favor to me. Now, later on in the Gospels, Jesus is gonna confront the Pharisees on the same way of thinking, saying, they only do good to those who can pay you. And he even asked the question, what, what good is that? Like, everybody does that. Like, I'll, I'll help you out because I know you're gonna pay me back later, right? There's no sacrifice, there's no giving in it because I know I'm gonna get a return. And so in this man's mind, when he approaches Jesus, he has two teachings in his mind, which is, my neighbor is the good, devout person, not the sinner, and it's the person who can pay me back and return the favor. So what he's really asking Jesus in his question of verse 29, who is my neighbor? He's really asking, is the sinner really my neighbor? Do I really have to love the sinner? And do I really have to love the person who could never pay me back? And then Jesus tells him a parable. Now just up front, just so you know, sometimes we get a little familiar with passages, we kind of forget the details. 
He asks, who's my neighbor? And Jesus will never answer the question. The, this parable does not answer the question of who's my neighbor. It answers the question of how do I be a neighbor? Right? So here we go. Here's Jesus' reply in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. When he saw the injured man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came up to the place and saw, passed by on the other side. So here's the picture. There's a man. He's an Israelite. He's a Jew. He's been beaten and robbed, and he's left for dead on the side of a road. By the way, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a major highway, so there'd be a lot of people passing through. So when Jesus goes, oh, just by chance, he's kind of being funny, right? Like, of course, somebody's going to walk by this major highway. And he goes, oh, a priest came by. Now, you understand this man, he's an expert in religious law, meaning what we call the Old Testament, the books of Moses. He knows that the job of the priest is to show mercy and kindness of God to the people. So in his mind, before Jesus is getting done with the parable, he's going to go, oh, well, the priest is surely going to stop and help this guy. And then he doesn't. And then a Levite shows up. If you don't know what a Levite is, they were the church workers. They served in the, te- in the temple, and in, in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, uh, helping the priests and serving the Lord in all kinds of ways. And so they would know the laws. They would know the rules. And out of their vocation, of course, they would surely stop and help the man. But he doesn't. So you have to understand that for the expert in the law hearing this story, this is unbelievable statements from Jesus. How could a priest and a Levite see a fellow Israelite, a fellow Jew, left for dead, wounded and beaten up, and not just walk by him? What did Jesus say? Pass by on the other side. So we're out on rainbow. <laughs> You're doing the death-defying stunt of crossing the traffic because there's no walkways, all right? And you see someone hurting, and they're wounded. They're left for dead. And you decide, I'm going to risk going across to the other side to pass them by. Right? You know what that means? You're intentionally choosing to do what? Ignore them. Dismiss them. Be like, oh, it's not just that I didn't see you there. Oh, my bad. It's they went and passed by on the other side. So if you're the religious expert, you're like, this story is ridiculous, Jesus. There's no way a priest would do that. There's no way a Levite would do it. There's no way that they would do it back to back. (laughs) This is unbelievable. And then Jesus is going to shock the world by saying, the Samaritan is the good one. So he goes on. In verse 33, but a Samaritan who was traveling came to where the injured man was, and when he saw him, he felt compassion for him. Now, that little statement, felt compassion, sometimes there's a cultural separation when we read the Bible, because most of us go, well, like any decent human being would what? Feel compassion for someone that had been robbed and beaten and left for dead. You'd be like, oh my goodness, we got to call the police, call 911, like get some help for this person. But that phrase that the Samaritan felt compassion for the Israelite, for the Jew, was simply an unbelievable statement for the expert in the law to hear. Many of you are familiar with that the Jews and the Samaritans do not like each other. There's the very famous story in the Gospel of John of Jesus interacting with the Samaritan woman at the well, and there was some religious differences because of it, but one of the big reasons is what we read in the Old Testament reading in 2 Chronicles 28, where the Israelite northern kingdom, which had become the Samaritans, come down, because their capital is Samaria, and invade the southern kingdom of Judah, where their brothers their tribesmen are, and they kill a couple hundred thousand of them, and then take 200,000 into captivity to enslave them. Guess who didn't forget about that? 
the people living in Jerusalem and Judah, the Israel, the Jews, the expert in the law, right? They have centuries of bitterness and rivalry and unforgiveness. There is no way in his imagination that he could picture a Samaritan being anything good, especially being the one to show compassion when the priest, the Levite, refused to. Now, there's this wonderful question in the Old Testament reading that the prophet Oded asked when he says, do you not have sin and guilt of your own before the Lord your God? Because that's the expert in the law's issue. He's asking the question in verse 29, who's my neighbor? Because he wanted to justify himself. His view of it was, I've already done the law perfectly. I know the answer. I love the Lord with all my heart and all my soul, all my mind and all my strength. And I love my neighbor as long as my neighbor is only the good, devout, religious person that's exactly like me, doesn't have any sin or guilt, and can pay me back all the favors that I do to him. So the expert in the law is like, I'm asking this question because I'm, I'm already good. And Jesus is saying, actually, the Levite and the priest are the bad people in this story. Meaning the devout, good, religious person is the bad person in this story. And the Samaritan, by the way, who the expert law would say is never my neighbor, is the good person. For the, expert, for the people here in this story, this would have been an earth-shattering idea. How could the Samaritan be the one that feels compassion? And here's our struggle. We so want to be like the expert in the law. You don't right now because you're like, oh, he's the bad guy in the story and I'm not the bad person. We want to justify ourselves so badly. We think, I'm already good. I know we say in the confession, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. But just for fun, how many of you forget that during the week? And just go, and I'm a good person, right? How many of us are tempted to be like the religious expert and go throughout our week and our daily lives, I am a good person, I, I love the Lord, I do the right things, I'm so much better than the Samaritan. And we forget Oded's question of, don't you have your own sin and guilt before the Lord your God? We're like, no, not really, because I, I, I'm good. I love Jesus. How many of you love Jesus? How many of you try to be good and nice to other people? Show of hands. Find out who's friendly in the church. Yeah, we're just like the expert in the law, right? I'm a good person. And it's shocking when Jesus is like, oh, no, no, no. These guys aren't good just because they're a Levite and a priest. In fact, the Samaritan's good because he's the one that was a neighbor, that showed compassion when nobody else would. And so the story goes on. He feels compassion for him, verse 34. He went up to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring olive oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever else you spend, I will repay you when I come back this way. So which of these three do you think became a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Right. So the question, Jesus isn't even answering the question of who my neighbor is. He's trying to show the religious man, here's what I want you to be, is a good neighbor. So he asked the question, like, who, who was the good neighbor? Now, the answer is really obvious, guys. It is who? The Samaritan. That's why we call the parable <laughs> the good <laughs> Samaritan. But here's how the man answers. I want you to see his struggle and our struggle with living this out. The one who showed mercy to him. So guess what he didn't say? The Samaritan, because he, he has so much disdain for the Samaritan. He thinks, I am already good. I am already justified because I love my neighbor and I love the Lord. 
I'm so much better than a Samaritan. He won't even say the Samaritan's name. He just says, well, that guy over there that did the good thing, he's the good one. Right? Now, here's why this is so shocking. In their world, there's no way a Samaritan would ever be this good. In their viewpoint, the Samaritans view it as they don't deserve our mercy and our kindness and our compassion. And for the Jew, he's like, they're so bad and wicked. We've got such a history with them. There's no way they could ever become a good person. Now, here's the real thing. If you were a Jew, if you were an Israelite, and you had a choice, you'd say, I think I'd rather just die than take the help from the Samaritan. Anybody ever struggled to receive help and grace from somebody else? And sometimes you're like, oh, it's because I'm always the helper. But what if it was your enemy that wanted to be kind to you? And you're like, I'd rather just keep suffering than take help from the likes of you, <laughs> right? I'd rather just not not have them in my life or I don't want to be in their debt or anything like that, right? These two people groups are so opposed to each other. They can't imagine kindness from one another. They can't imagine that compassion would go from one to the other, which is why the man doesn't say the Samaritan. He just says, yeah, the one that showed mercy. And here's the real rocking statement of the parable. So Jesus said to the expert in the religious law, you go and do the same. The same as who? Samaritan. You, this Jewish Israelite expert in the law, I want you to go be like the Samaritan. Why? Because he was the one who was a good neighbor. Now here's the deal. That's where my professor in college ended the service. He was just like, you just go do the same thing. And you're like, eh. Because, <laughs> right, we're all in church, so it sounds good, right? How many of you like the parable of the Good Samaritan? You're like, yeah, this is a good story. I like hearing about it, right? And you're like, yeah. That like How many of you like the ending <laughs> when Jesus is like, I want you to go and do the same? Because here's what the same looks like. The same as the Good Samaritan looks like loving the sinner. It looks like, by the way, when I say sinner, I'm not meaning we're all poor, miserable sinners before the cross of Christ, which is absolutely true. I'm meaning in, in this context, right? The expert in the religious law had his own definition of sinner. And guess who wasn't in it? Him and all of his buddies. Because he wants to justify himself. And how often do we want to justify ourselves and say, I'm good, but you know who the real sinners are, right? I know we're Lutheran. We do confession and absolution, but here's what we do as human beings so often, and I'm guilty of it too. Oh, yeah, we'll give lip service, like, I'm a poor, miserable sinner, yeah, 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 yeah. But you know who the real sinners are? They're the people that fill in your blank for whatever you think is bad, and sinful, and not as good as you. And Jesus is like, I want you to go and love those people. That's what it means to be a neighbor. That's who your neighbor is. And now we don't like the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus is like, that's what I want you to do. And then notice that the Samaritan pays for everything for the wounded man, right? Meaning, the wounded man will never be able to repay this cost. And what was one of the questions the expert in law asked? Do I really have to love people that could never pay me back for it? Just do good for the sake of goodness and kindness and love with no return. And then Jesus gets to the end of the parable and goes, well, that's what the good Samaritan did. And I want you to do the exact same. Now, here's the reality. It sounds good on paper but it's really hard. It's really hard to walk out of here and go, I'm gonna go do the same. And if we think that that's the main point of the parable, we miss it. Here's the main point of the parable. It's a very Sunday school answer. Jesus. Okay, so if you're taking notes, write his name down. Be like, oh, the good Samaritan is all about Jesus. Because he's teaching how to be a good neighbor, correct? 
He's not teaching what our neighbor is so we can limit our love. He's saying, no, I want you to bring more love into the world by being a good neighbor to people. Yes, to those people. And yes, to those people that can never pay back. So the answer to the question of the man's question, do I really have to love the sinner? Do I really have to love the person that could never pay me back and return the favor? Is yes, because that is what Christ was for you. Because Jesus came and loved you while you were a sinner that everybody else wanted to pass around. And we're like, oh, we're not gonna help them. Right? When you and I are left for dead and wounded and beaten up by the sins of the world and our sins that we commit ourselves, what does Romans 3 say? The wages of sin is death. We, we owe this debt. We deserve to die. And yet Romans 5 says, it was while we were still sinners that Christ came and died for us. See, the, the parable is about Jesus being the perfect neighbor to you and me. We were beaten and wounded and left for dead in our sins. He came and healed us and bound up our wounds and paid for the wages of death. And then the Good Samaritan says, Here, here's all the cost, here's all the price to pay for this man, and whatever else is left over, put it on my tab and I'll pay for it all. It's a price he could never pay back. And first, Peter, we're told that Jesus redeems you, which is a word that means to buy back, okay? It's a, to purchase. So when Jesus bought you back from the wages of sin, Peter says he didn't just do it with a couple silver coins and some denarii. Peter says he did it with his precious blood. And so Jesus, again, is the perfect neighbor to you and me, paying a price for us that we could never pay him back. And I love when the Good Samaritan says, whatever else comes up, whatever else is on the bill, I'll keep paying for it. It means Jesus doesn't just forgive you once for the sins you did in the past. It means whatever sins come up in your life later on, as you're following him, as you and I are being imperfect, not awesome neighbors, not good Samaritans all the time, Jesus says, no, 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 whatever else comes up, I'll, I'll keep paying for that and keep forgiving it. See, the secret to you and I actually being good neighbors is knowing that Jesus was our perfect neighbor first and believing in him and trusting him and going, oh, he, I can love this sinner because when I'm a sinner, Jesus loves me. I can love people and help people who will never be able to return the favor because you're never gonna pay Jesus back for the cross. And he's never gonna ask you to, right? John 3, 16, another very famous verse that everybody knows. For God so loved the world. The word love there, there's several words in Greek for love. The word there is agape, which is, means a love that requires nothing in return. That's an amazing kind of love. So Jesus says, but that's the kind of love I've given to you. So the secret to you and I going out of here and doing what Jesus says of like, now go do likewise, be the good Samaritan, is knowing that Jesus was the good Samaritan to me first. And when I was a sinner, he forgave me and loved me and bound up my wounds. When I had a debt that I could never pay off, he paid it for me and gave me a love I could never return the favor for. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the good Samaritan towards us, that you love us with an agape love, a love that demands and expects nothing in return. We thank you that you were the perfect neighbor to us, loving us while we were still sinners and paying a debt we could never cover ourselves. Because of your great love transforming our hearts and minds, may we be people who leave this place and live like good Samaritans in the world so that more people will know your grace and love. In your name we pray, amen.